Tonight, a suspected car bomb kills the daughter of a close Putin ally. Ukraine prepares for intense assaults as the war approaches a milestone date. As four of Canada's premiers get set to meet, healthcare workers sound the alarm about summer staffing shortages from coast to coast to coast. Nurses are human beings, they're not robots. There's no magic, easy, quick fix. Two of Canada's biggest summer fairs are back. We'll take you for a ride. And the general manager of the Calgary Flames takes us behind the scenes of that rapid midsummer rebuild while shouldering the pressure of a city's reputation. It is a wonderful place to play. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. As Russia's grinding war in Ukraine approaches the half-year mark, an explosion near Moscow has killed the daughter of a high-profile Putin ally, raising questions about violence spreading far beyond the battlefield. The weekend suspected car bombing took the life of a 29-year-old Russian journalist and political activist, but it's believed the target was her father, an ultra-conservative political philosopher and nationalist who believes in aggressive Russian expansion and is referred to as Putin's brain. A criminal investigation has been launched, but some Russians are already pointing fingers at Ukraine, which denies any involvement. Here's Briar Short with what we know about the attack and the controversial figure it was likely meant to kill. Investigators picked through the remnants of a deadly car explosion, an attack that appears to have brought the fallout from the Ukrainian invasion right to the door of Russia's capital. 29-year-old Daria Dugana was killed in this explosion. Many have suggested her father was the intended target. In a video published by Russian media, Alexander Dugan can be seen distraught on the side of the road. He was in a different car traveling behind her. A state news outlet reported that he was originally supposed to be in the car she was in. This was Dugan in 2014 suggesting that Ukrainians need to be killed in retribution for an attack in Donetsk. He's a political philosopher who thinks Russia needs to seize and consolidate power to challenge the strength of the West. And Russia says, no, you are not boss. You are not anymore boss. He and his daughter have been sanctioned by the U.S., Britain and Canada for spreading disinformation. And Daria Dugina was very active in this aggression in Ukraine. She was writing a book about glorifying this war. She visited Mariupol recently. She called for public execution of Azov-style prisoners, etc. She last appeared on state TV boasting that Russia was being delicate when it came to what it calls its special operation. She said Russia should hold tribunals across eastern Ukraine to, quote, investigate these people who are already not human. Her father wasn't a regular commentator, and a longtime friend says he wasn't as influential as some have claimed. Alexander Dugin had been never invited to the main Russian TV channels because uh, government regard him as uh, too uh, radical. Sergei Markov, who's also outspoken and supports the Russian invasion, says many like him now fear for their safety. Ukraine says it isn't responsible. What is clear, it has created a new sense of unease in Moscow and likely little sympathy in Ukraine. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Tallinn, Estonia. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is warning of possible Russian escalation ahead of Ukraine's Independence Day this Wednesday. In that video address this weekend, Zelensky said he fears Russia could do something, quote, particularly nasty, though he didn't say what that might be. Ukrainian forces displayed a huge cache of destroyed Russian military hardware on the streets of Kyiv, everything from tanks and trucks to shells and rockets. Russian forces remain on alert in occupied Crimea after another reported Ukrainian drone attack this weekend. Air defense systems kicked in over the port city of Sevastopol, where Russia keeps its Black Sea fleet. No injuries were reported, though Russia claims it shot down at least one drone over Navy headquarters. The war in Ukraine will be on the agenda for German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's visit to Canada. He arrived tonight. Greeted in Montreal by the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, his visit is focused largely on energy issues. 
Schultz is expected to sign a deal that will see Canada provide Germany with clean hydrogen. More evidence this weekend that Canada's health care system is under terrible strain, something so many Canadians know firsthand. With four premiers set to discuss problems plaguing the system tomorrow, Talia Ricci shows us some of what they'll be talking about. As the weekend kicked off, Manitoba's busiest emergency department needed at least 24 nurses, but their union says only eight were scheduled. Basically, if there isn't a nurse to uh, look after a patient in the bed, it's just a piece of furniture. Health officials say staff were reassigned from other parts of the hospital and asked to work overtime. Part-time employees were also called in. People are just desperately tired, frustrated, um, frightened and burned out. In Ontario, staffing issues forced some hospitals to close their ERs at various times throughout the summer. High degree of uncertainty and certainly a lot of distress and moral injury. This weekend, two hospitals north of Toronto warned people to seek alternative help for anything less than an emergency. It is incredibly difficult. We struggle to meet the demands of patient care and we have no end in sight. Those struggles are happening across Canada. In the Northwest Territories, paramedics will now be called into health care centres to help out. In BC, one third of nurses worked overtime this year. That's more than the national average. When they are continuously um, called upon to pick up extra shifts, to extend their shifts from 12 hours to 16 hours or more. Um, nurses are human beings, they're not robots. Saskatchewan will soon move some patients to a private clinic in Calgary. Frontline staff say it would help if nurses could also move across provincial borders. With nurse professionals moving from one province to the other, there are many barriers. The struggling health care system is expected to be discussed when the Premier of Ontario meets his maritime counterparts this week. And the clock is ticking. Experts warn the problem will only get worse this fall with an expected rise in flu and COVID patients. I think we're going to see some challenges within the health care sector this winter. And the other sort of unfortunate part is there's no magic, easy, quick fix. That's all too clear to hospital staff struggling even now to care for those who need it. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. There are concerns tonight about monkeypox and its spread throughout the United States, where the demand for vaccines is still far greater than supply. Katie Simpson shows us the changes to the vaccine rollout and the urgent calls to make it faster. Late summer pride events across the United States are being used by public health officials to connect with communities at a higher risk of contracting monkeypox. At a parade in North Carolina, some 2,000 doses of the vaccine were administered this weekend alone. Doing an event like this and having people reaching out and telling people where to get it, when to get it, made it very easy. It's rare to hear getting a monkeypox vaccine is easy. Demand is still outpacing supply, leading to lineups and frustration. The illness is spreading across the U.S. with more than 14,000 confirmed cases, a number that is likely low because of a lack of testing. And New York just confirmed its first case in a child. I think what just was so disturbing to me about monkeypox is a lot of the issues that got us into the ditch with COVID were repeated. Those mistakes were repeated with monkeypox. Dr. Deborah Burke served as the White House COVID coordinator under President Donald Trump. She says the Biden administration's monkeypox response has been too slow and that it failed to engage with those most at risk. While anyone can get monkeypox, the vast majority of cases have been in men who have sex with men. If they had communicated to that group, if they had provided testing, if they had provided vaccines to all of them in May, we wouldn't have this problem in August. The White House says an additional 1.8 million doses will be available for public health officials to order this coming week. These shots are not part of a new delivery. The federal government is instead requiring smaller doses be given out as a way to stretch out supply. But with college students starting to return to campuses, there are fears the response is not nearly enough. Young people will be coming back en masse, which creates the real and imminent danger that we will see a massive outbreak of monkeypox unless we have sufficient vaccine. 
And Katie, there are more than a dozen lawmakers demanding the White House do more to deal with this outbreak. What do they want to see? They've written a letter urging President Joe Biden to invoke the Defense Production Act as a way to speed up domestic manufacturing of the vaccine. The act gives the federal government the power to order private companies to prioritize government contracts and to help get those corporations any supplies they may need. The DPA was used recently to help address the baby formula shortage and has been used several times since the COVID pandemic began. Biden is under pressure to do more as monkeypox continues to spread. Ian. Okay, Katie, thank you. There are extreme weather events unfolding around the world tonight. The U.S. Southwest is dealing with a devastating drought. The Arizona Senator Mark Kelly says that governments need to step up to prevent a catastrophe. We need the other upper and lower basin states to step up and do their part. If they do that, we're not going to have a, as you say, a catastrophic collapse of the system. Uh, we will be able to stabilize it. Water levels on the Colorado River are so low that a water shortage was declared last week. In California, there's a crackdown on lawn watering. The government is paying people up to $6 per square foot to remove their grass. Europe also grappling with historic droughts and sweltering conditions. And low water levels in lakes and rivers are exposing pieces of history. In Germany, the Rhine has revealed so-called hunger stones from decades ago. An ominous warning placed there to mark low water levels during previous droughts. The receding Danube River has exposed German warships sunk during World War II and in India. It is severe flooding causing destruction in the north and east. Heavy rains swelling the Yamuna River today, inundating neighborhoods. Floods and landslides have killed at least 50 people in parts of the country. The rain swept away homes, leaving residents stranded. Finland's prime minister is awaiting the results of a drug test, all part of criticism by some over leaked video of her dancing at a private party. At the Moore shows us the video and questions that it's raised about a gender gap in political accountability. A leaked video in which Finnish Prime Minister Sanna Marin, seen on the left, is dancing with friends. In the wake of the leak, Marin faced criticism from opposition parties. One leader asked that she take a drug test. The 36-year-old Prime Minister defended her actions. We didn't have any government meetings during that week and I had time off and, and spent it with my friends uh, and did nothing illegal. Despite saying she's never taken drugs, Marin did take a drug test, saying it was for her own legal protection. As she faces scrutiny, many have come to her defense on social media, including Montreal Mayor Valérie Plante. Plante posted part of Cindy Lauper's hit song to Instagram Saturday, writing in French, me in the face of reactions against the Prime Minister of Finland, adding an eye roll emoji and a frustrated emoji. I think it's a real double standard. Former Canadian MP Peggy Nash is not surprised. She helped found an organization that encourages women to enter politics. I think because she is a young woman, there is a tendency not to treat her seriously and to, to hold her to a hypercritical standard. This isn't the first time Marin's social life has made waves. In December, she went to a club without her work phone and missed a text message saying she'd been in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. Marin apologized but did not test positive for the virus. The results of her recent drug test are expected this coming week. Matt Lamour, CBC News, Montreal. A neighborhood in British Columbia is reeling from a tragedy tonight. Two people were killed in an outdoor wedding in West Vancouver yesterday after a car drove into the yard where that wedding was being held. Ten others were injured. Emergency responders say a driver was using a shared driveway. At this point, no charges have been laid and police have promised to update the story tomorrow. Ferry service to Toronto Island was partially restored today after a frightening crash on Saturday. I feel it's so terrible. I thought maybe I almost died because people fall down on my body. It happened as the boat was docking, the cause not yet known. At least 12 people suffered minor injuries. The city says the ferry has been taken out of service and wait times will be longer for the rest of the summer. 
Crowds in Toronto and Vancouver have been enjoying a late summer tradition this weekend. Both the Canadian and the Pacific National Exhibitions opened their gates. And as Susanna De Silva shows us, after two years of pandemic restrictions, fairgoers and Susie were ready for a ride. A roller coaster is a pretty good analogy for what the world has been through the last couple of years. So what better way to welcome more people back to the PE than with a refurbished classic? Over the last 18 months, we did a major restoration, about a million dollars in work, um, about 12,000 feet of wood replaced on the coaster. The wooden roller coaster opened in 1958 at a cost of $200,000. It's kind of scary from the first drop. First time riding it, pretty intense. In a big drop? I'm not doing that again. <laughs> a scaled back fair was held last year, and while this year it has expanded, some smaller buildings are still closed, masks are recommended inside, and numbers are still limited. We are estimating that this year's attendance over the 15 days will be about half a million people. Our normal fair, we would be anywhere from seven to 750,000. Jimmy's Lunch has been a vendor here since 1929. His grandson, who started working the fair at the age of seven, is happy more people will get a chance to try their burgers. It started off as more of not a fast food restaurant, but a sit down and they had real china and then it evolved over time. Yeah, great to be back. In Toronto, the CNE is back after a two-year hiatus. I'm just here to have fun and continue living and uh, hope for the best and have a good time with a lot of people. It has its own new offerings, COVID-19 vaccinations, along with maybe some new classics. And I've had better ice cream, but for ketchup ice cream, it's not terrible. <laughs> But the CNE is also dealing with a labor dispute. Ride safety inspectors are off the job, though officials insist rides remain safe. I have to be brave enough to go for the boys' sake so they can see that that is not scared. <laughs> and after two years, fair goers and organizers are hoping for nothing but fun. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Canada has won the World Junior Hockey Championship for the 19th time, taking the gold over Finland in a thrilling 3-2 overtime victory in Edmonton last night. That was the goal that won the game for Team Canada. Kent Johnson putting away a rebound for the gold about three minutes into overtime. But just seconds earlier, this was the moment that saved it. Team Canada captain Mason McTavish knocking down the puck in midair just before it would have crossed the goal line and given the gold to Finland. McTavish was later named the tournament's most valuable player. But despite Canada's big win, this year's World Juniors was plagued by unusually low attendance. Normally played around Christmas, it was delayed by the pandemic. And then, of course, there was the backdrop of the unfolding Hockey Canada scandal with former players accused of sexual assault. This is a tough enough tournament to, uh, to win when, when it's a normal tournament at Christmas time. And uh, for this group to come in here under the cloud that they come in with what was going on. The next World Junior is just months away now. The puck drops Boxing Day in Halifax. The city of Calgary is celebrating a different kind of hockey victory these days. I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a little bit of a gut punch. Up next, my conversation with the Flames general manager on his tumultuous offseason and how he turned things around. Plus, Ryan Reynolds opens up about the importance of giving back. I grew up here and I want it to be better. Why his love for Canada is part of the story. And later, a cancer diagnosis prevented him from joining his teammates so they found another way of making sure he never missed a game. I just want to thank you guys so much for being there for me. We love you, man. We'll be right back. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Canadian boy, I uh, love the, the country of Canada, love the city of Calgary. That is brand new Calgary Flame, Nazem Kadri. The latest acquisition and general manager, Brad Treliving's impressive rebuilding campaign in what started as a pretty rough offseason. 
After losing the Battle of Alberta and getting knocked out of the playoffs, the Flames then lost one of their best players, Johnny Gaudreau, to free agency. Shortly after, another young star, Matthew Kachuk, said he wanted out too. Things looked bleak. So Treliving got to work. You know, you dust yourself off and, and you get after it. First trading Kachuk for two Canadians, top scorer Jonathan Huberdeau and Mackenzie Wieger. Then, just days ago, getting Kadri to sign a seven-year, $49 million deal. And just like that, the Flames seem to have turned things around. Thanks to their general manager. And here he is joining us from his home in Calgary, the man behind the Flames' summer of change. Brad, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's go back to mid-July for a moment. One star chooses to leave your team as a free agent. A second made it clear that he would leave when his contract was up. I've never even met you, and I was feeling badly for you. How are you feeling at that point? Well, it's been it's been an interesting few weeks to say the least. And you know, certainly when we, you know, these these are things that, quite frankly, we we had discussed throughout the year and knew there was always different possibilities. Um, you know, we were hoping to get both John and Matthew signed. That was the goal of ours. And and when we went, uh, you know, got to just before free agency and learned that John was going to go to the market, um, and then shortly thereafter. Matthew, um, you know, was looking for a change and wasn't going to sign with us long term. I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a little bit, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a gut punch, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, those are two young guys that have been with us a long time and, and, and most importantly, are two real good hockey players. So um, it's certainly, it's certainly, you know, it, it made for some tense few days, but uh, we were able to regroup and, and deal with it the best we could. And, and uh, you know our motto was just to let's let's keep looking forward and find a way that to, to navigate through this and and certainly we're we're happy with where we're at today. Now some people said at that point when things looked bleak that the reputation of Calgary was on the line and they didn't mean just the team but the city like maybe stars didn't want to play there and you seem to take that personally. Yeah, I I, I might not have. I've been known to maybe speak without thinking a few times here, my <laughs> wife would tell you. Um, so I, I don't necessarily know if it was the, 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 I guess the narrative around it for us that all of a sudden, and, and listen, these are two impactful players and you have them sort of on top of each other stating that they're going to go play elsewhere. And, and so that narrative started about, you know, is Calgary a place that people want to be? And, you know, I just felt strongly that that wasn't, that wasn't, you know, that what that shouldn't be the narrative. Um, we've, we've got a great city here. Anybody that spent some time in Calgary, I think can attest to it. Um, we've got a good team and it just, it, this was happenstance. And this, this was just, you know, a, a unique situation. And as I said all along, the players have the right to make those decisions. I hold no ill will. Those that's, that's the business. Um, you know, they get to a certain point in their, in their career and the CBA dictates that they've got certain rights and, they made those decisions, but I didn't want those two decisions to be, um, we didn't feel that those should be an overriding theme that uh, Calgary isn't a great place to play or live or, 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 or any of that. So um, that was sort of really our position on it. It's, it is a wonderful place to play. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. Um, and we think we got a good hockey team. We only have a couple of minutes here and I've got so many questions, but I'll try to squeeze in two more. Um, your dad, of course, a lot of our audience familiar with Jim Treliving, the, the Dragon's Den or former Dragon's Den mogul. Did you call him for any advice this summer? <laughs> well, he was uh, probably like a lot of people. I got, I felt like I, uh, there was a death in the family those first couple of days. There was a lot of people phoning, you know, that, uh, giving you a lot of uh, sympathy, if nothing else. But I had a couple of conversations with him. So he was, as usual, just real supportive and, and you know, like everything else, just stick to it and, and uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So, uh, uh, but he's always, he's always been real supportive and, and, you know, he's, he's a great ear to, to bounce ideas off. And, and at those times, I think he was more sympathetic and um, just listening to me bitch and complain a little bit more than anything else. We have less than a minute, but but I, I guess I, I can ask you this because it, it feels like there are lessons here for people who are even executives in businesses outside of hockey. I mean, what did you learn about how to approach a crisis this summer? Well, I think, you you know, it's like anything else. You, you, you got to remove emotion from it. Um, 
And, you know, quite frankly, we were able to do the things we were able to do for, you know, number one, we've got great ownership led by Murray Edwards. So they, they were supportive right through this whole process. And, you know, I'm fortunate to have a great team around me and, you know, get, get, get the right people in place. And so we, this wasn't, this wasn't Brad attacking the problem. This was our entire team that said, okay, we're, we've got an issue here. It's not make it any bigger or smaller than it is, and let's try to find solutions. And so the, the entire management team went to work and, and started looking at ideas and thoughts. And, um, and we were able to navigate, navigate our way through it. We'll see how things go. Listen, there's no guarantees, but um, you know, having strong people around you and having a lot of support, I think anytime you're going through a little turbulence, those are the two most important things. And, and can your team beat Edmonton now? <laughs> well, I got a heck, heck of a team. We, we'll, we'll wait till the season gets going here. We hopefully can continue to make our team stronger, but uh, hopefully this, this continues that battle of Alberta that we saw last year throughout the year, two good teams, and uh, we'll see where the season gets to. Well, you had a remarkable summer, and uh, what a comeback, and uh, I hope you get a chance to at least have a few days off before the hockey season starts. <laughs> I appreciate it, Ian. Thanks very much. So it doesn't get much more Canadian than hockey talk in August, unless you're talking about my next interview. I would say that that's probably a not up-to-date photo of the 25th and Oak Safeway store. Up next, Ryan Reynolds on his career success and what keeps him grounded. Most people know Ryan Reynolds for what they see on the big screen, but the Hollywood superstar from Canada has a lot of projects on the go. Reynolds posted some pictures to social media over the weekend, visiting the home of his Welsh soccer team, Wrexham AFC. He bought the club over a year ago, making a multi-million dollar investment to try to turn its fortunes around. But Reynolds' off-screen passions go far beyond soccer. I sat down with him earlier this year to talk about his drive to give back his success in Hollywood, and his strong connection to Canada, starting with some memories from his hometown here in Vancouver. We're going to play a game. Sure, um, and, love games. And I'm going to show you three pictures. <laughs> and uh, you get one point if you identify the picture, and you get five points if you come up with an interesting story about the picture. Wow, yeah. I like this game already. Yeah, so here you go. Here's the first picture. First picture, that is Kitsilano Secondary School. Yeah. That is my high school. Yeah, so you get the one point for that. Tell me something interesting about your time in high school. Uh, in high school, uh, okay, terrified to go to. I went, I, I actually was at a school called uh, Prince of Wales before that. I did an amazing program there where I, that's sort of where I became an environmentalist to a certain degree, which was this program called Trek, mm -hmm. Clatwa Trek they had, which is kids get to immerse themselves in the outdoors. They spend six months doing school and then six months, you just get to do a year's worth of schoolwork in six months and then the rest of the time you're outside. And all amazing, amazing program. But then I had to go back into the main school system and I was like a real introvert as a kid. I did not like school. I did not like the social pressures. I did not like the dynamics. See, that, uh, that sounds like it might be myth-making because you seem hardly introverted now, but you really yeah. were like that? Okay, this is a bit of a tangent, but I <laughs> I am, I have always had this sort of thing where, you know, like I, I, I think about Dave Letterman sometimes when I would mm -hmm. go on the Dave Letterman show and, and that's a big talk show to go on. And, you know, he doesn't, obviously he doesn't do the show anymore, but I remember he was always the guy that, that other performers when they were going on the show had some reverence for, uh, a little bit of fear because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, if he doesn't like you, how does this go? You know, that sort of thing. And I used to stand behind that curtain as they were announcing my name and thinking, I'm going to die. Like I'm actually, when that curtain opens, I'm either just gonna like fall out of it like a, <laughs> like a comedic corpse bashing mm -hmm. off the ground or I'm just gonna projectile vomit over everybody. And as soon as he called my name and I start to step out there, I noted that this sort of little guy takes over. Oh, no. And this little guy's like confident and kinda, he can throw a joke around here and there and all that stuff. And then I realized that that's the same guy that is like responsible for my career, responsible for a lot of the things that I get to do. He's, he's not necessarily real, the real me, but he keeps me safe and protects me. So that, that, that guy has kind of been around since high school. And you could try, I could turn him on and off um, a lot better as I got older. But when I was younger, I, I struggled with that stuff. And I, and I don't look back at it with a boo-hoo story. I mean, you know, every, I've learned more from failures and insecurities and all sorts of things than I've ever learned from successes in life. Second uh, picture. Second picture. Oh gosh, I would. 
Now I would say that that's probably a not up to date photo of the 25th and Oak Safeway store. It Am is a completely right? up to date picture. My wife took this picture this week. What? Can I see it? Yeah. That's the old stomping grounds. You know, I used to face this fridge out. I, like yeah. I would have to make sure everything was just perfectly smooth and all the labels out. I loved working at Safeway. I worked, uh, a lot of the time I worked there was midnight to 8 a.m., the sort of graveyard shift, which was interesting. And, I, and then I moved to cashier. I did everything in that store. I, you cashier. were a cashier there? Yeah, I was also a cashier. I also bagged groceries. I used to bag Sarah McLaughlin's groceries. Wow. And I always noted that she was incredibly kind to everybody that she met in that store. Didn't have to be. No one even knew it was her. Half the time she had like a tooth pulled down and I always knew that was her. And yeah. She was awesome. Again, full five points full five for that. Points. Okay, final picture here, Landmark, Vancouver. Landmark, well that's the viaduct right there. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot, baby. Shoot, shoot, baby. my first sort of foray into producing, properly producing a movie and managing budgets and all kinds of stuff. And boy, that Georgia Viaduct saved our life. It really did because we didn't, we had to cut all these huge action sequences and replace spectacle with character, which later in my life became an, an enormous lesson in marketing and every other business I would pursue, that necessity being the mother invention is the greatest, greatest creative tool you could ever have. But a lot of those lessons were kind of forged in 2015 as I sat on that Georgia Viaduct trying to figure out how the hell I'm going to get through this movie on the paltry amount of money they've given us to shoot it. One of the really interesting things for me to see your work is is your voice seems consistent. So from movies to ads to viral videos that you do. Um, and, and let's talk about the ads for a moment. Like, how did that come about? Um, I created a marketing company. I created a production company called Maximum Effort mm -hmm. Productions, which became, uh, or an offshoot of it, became Maximum Effort Marketing, which became a juggernaut. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it happened sort of by accident. Um, I bought Aviation Gin, which is a gin company that I couldn't really find anywhere, so I, I, I knew it was the top-rated gin, you know, in the world at the time, and there was such a small or uh, sort of low supply of it. So I saw a real space there to kind of grow this company, and. Uh, and I needed marketing to back that up, so I started my own marketing company uh, with my partner, George Dewey. You know, people come up to me all the time and they say, what makes aviation gin so delicious? Most of the time I run away because non-celebrities frighten me. At the end of the day, it, it's just about telling stories. I mean, whether you're telling stories in marketing or whether you're telling stories in movies, um, that's always this sort of congruent sort of uh, factor that ties them all together, is it's storytelling. They asked me to write you a number To show you just how we all feel We know you're a fan of the land we call Canada But here's what I've got to reveal That Canada loves you back Canada loves you back So, actor, uh, entrepreneur, creative person, and philanthropist. I mean, you and your wife seem to have really embraced charitable giving. And so that video, for example, uh, for the Governor General's Award at the end, there's that those credits that roll or the thank yous, basically. Mm. I assume that a lot of people in your business give a certain amount of money. But the thing that with you is that it just seems so thoughtful mm. and and varied. And I just wonder, this is actually my wife's question for you. Mm -hmm. she, she was wondering, where does this come from? Where, where in your life or your wife's life mm -hmm. did the inspiration come to be so charitable? Um, oh boy, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, that we're, you know, part of why I've been successful, I think, in my business life is, is being somewhat self-aware. And, and I understand the idea that when you extract a lot from a system, you'd need to put back in, put some back in as well. So um, part of it comes from that. I can't, you know, safely say that I would enjoy my position in life if I wasn't sharing it. Um, you know, not just sharing wealth, but also sharing power, you know, stepping aside where appropriate as well. Um, and you can do all these things, and you know, at the end of the day, like you're still doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't change you know, much for your own personal situation other than it really feels great. But typically the, the, the organizations that we give to and the organizations that we support and, and the foundations that we create are usually something to do with sustainability. You know, sustainability in communities, um, sustainability in, in, you know, infrastructure to create jobs for folks who don't 
normally have that access or opportunity to those jobs. And um, that's the stuff I really love. Sick Kids Foundation is a big one that we, we do stuff for every year. Uh, you know, and that is a sustainable way to give. It isn't a one-time thing. It sort of just it grows and grows and grows. And I think I think of you know sharing. I don't want to call it charity, but sharing as an investment. They're all just investments. You know, they might not necessarily return dollars to you, but they'll they'll make they'll make the world a better place. They'll make Canada a better place. I mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of the goal. It's like I grew up I grew up here, and I want it to be better. You're having a moment. Uh, it's been going on for a while, but it's still like we're kind of a lot of success, right? You have a lot of success now in a business that can be really fickle. Mm. And so do you wonder if in five or 10 years, all this magic will still be as potent as it is right now? You know, Ian, I've never had like a high expectation of anything. There's no part of me that's like, I deserve this or I expect <laughs> this. Um, you know, anybody that's managed to come as far as I've come in this in this business, it's a, it's a certainly hard work is there. But there's a huge component of, of, of luck and circumstance and being in the right place at the right time. And, and then also being a person who is given access and opportunity at an, at an early age that I was born into and understanding that privilege and what that is. So I've never, I, my highest goal in show business was to be the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. Quite literally, <laughs> like if I had go to Los Angeles, I started an improv comedy. If mm -hmm. I could go to Los Angeles, I could get a job as the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. I would be set. That was all I ever really wanted. So everything else that's happened, and it's all happened quite slowly, has been a kind of an aggregate. Um, if you want to call it fame or any of that stuff, it's always been very slow. Today we honor with the 2,596 star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Ryan Reynolds. By virtue of that fact, it's, it's much easier to kind of watch and regulate and keep your head screwed on, right? Because it's not happening. I don't know how these young kids who just have this overnight success that is like a tidal wave. I don't know how they keep their heads, and, and oftentimes they don't, you know, and I, and I see the pitfalls of, of, of what this business can be like when it, when it happens sort of in a flash flood kind of sense. So for me, I was very lucky. I wasn't try, I was trying to make things happen fast at times, and other times I would just push it away. Um, so it happened very slowly, and it was in a, in a way kind of gave, gave me a sort of a, the benefit of immersion uh, that, that was, you know, that not everyone gets. I wondered what you'd seem like in person, and you do seem very level-headed, so. <laughs> you just that's, wait. That's, <laughs> I am going to toss all of this expensive camera gear around as soon as I leave. It's just one of the things I like to do at the end of an interview, <laughs> to create more of a myth. Excellent. Like, oh, God, yeah. totally normal on camera, and then just lost it. We'll keep rolling, the then. Yeah, yeah, I roll for it. It'll be really, it'll be great, great footage, great ratings, I think. It was unbelievable what happened next. Anyway, after the break, we revisit a reunion decades in the making. When it was first stolen, I don't think I slept for three or four days. I mean, I was up crying like somebody had stolen part of me. How Randy Bachman got his beloved guitar back. That's next. A classic Canadian summer playlist may have some Randy Bachman on it. Earlier this summer, he was reunited with the guitar he used to record some of his most iconic songs. It had been stolen decades ago. Tonight, we revisit Karen Paul's story about how he got it back. Let's exchange. Randy Bachman was shaking all over as he finally got his beloved guitar back. Amazing. An emotional moment, decades in the making. When it was first stolen, I don't think I slept for three or four days. I mean, I was up crying like somebody had stolen part of me. Uh, because you hold the guitar close to you, and it feels your heartbeat and your breathing, and it becomes part of you. Bachman recorded some iconic songs on this guitar. American Woman, She's Come Undone, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. B -b -b -baby, you just ain't seen yet. In the years after it was stolen, he bought as many guitars of the same model as he could find, hoping to find the one he had babysat, delivered newspapers, and cut grass for as a young man growing up in Winnipeg. Then a BC man found this video of a young Japanese musician on Christmas 2019. 
Takeshi bought the guitar at this Tokyo shop, not knowing anything about its history. But when he found out... So I didn't want Randy to miss this guitar any longer. I just thought it was right that I returned this guitar. In exchange, Backman found another vintage Gretsch made the same week as his and offered it as a trade. To find my guitar again was a miracle. To find its twin sister was another miracle, and to trade them will be the final miracle. This stuff only happens in movies. This Winnipeg author says it's a fairy tale ending and a significant moment in Canadian music history. Wow. It's the guitar that Randy played Sh Shaken All Over on, and Shaken All Over in 1965 became the first national rock and roll record from one end of Canada to the other to become a hit. Backman says this first performance was magical. He's looking forward to writing some new songs and taking care of some long overdue, unfinished business. Happy Canada Day. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. China may be the world's biggest movie market with a population approaching a billion and a half people, but with government censors calling the shots, Western filmmakers can find it hard to crack, and that includes Canadians. Earlier this year, Eli Glasner showed us what they're up against. The murderer is one of you. When Death on the Nile opens in China, it'll be a rare event. It's harder than ever. China is now the largest movie marketplace in the world, but many of last year's biggest films were never released there. Like Spider-Man No Way Home, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Black Widow, all titles that did not get into China. What's changed? In 2018, China's central propaganda department took over regulation and censorship. That means fewer Hollywood movies and only those that follow a strict set of rules. The Chinese Communist Party sees film as a vehicle for um, the development of cultural self-confidence, is what they call it. Now Chinese studios are producing lavish nationalistic war films, feel-good family films, and crowd-pleasing sequels, all with blockbuster-sized profits. The new shift hurts more than Disney's bottom line. It's also affecting Canadian filmmakers. In 2013, Sidney Chu helped make the Vancouver shot Finding Mr. Right a smash hit in China. We fast forward to today, and there's certainly, you know, situations between our governments that are not the best of uh, relationships too. The rumblings and the grumblings from myself and all my colleagues in China is that uh, uh, we've we got to kind of lay low for 10 years before we could probably approach um, our uh, films. While the increasing tension between China and the West is worrying. I find it kind of scary, if anything. You know, I don't want to live in a world where we don't have any sort of cultural overlaps in China. Director I mean, I Young Cheng is determined. It drives the way I want to tell stories and it's it's a place that I as a Chinese uh, you know person I feel uh, so close to. And as the challenges of working with China increase, experts say the potential payoff is simply too great to ignore. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Next, a team and a teammate with cancer motivate each other to battle through. Definitely our motivation for this. We want to do it for him and definitely make him proud. Uh, we're really playing for him out there, and this is for him. Defining the spirit of no man left behind in our moment. The gold medal is headed west. British Columbia, you are the Niagara 2022 Canada Summer Games champs. A golden moment for the BC lacrosse team at the Canada Summer Games but their roster was one man short. Ben Pollock wasn't able to go after being diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma just two months ago, but his teammates have made sure he's always part of the team, and that unbreakable bond is our moment. Fights, 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 and fights, and comes away with it. You guys have been very supportive of me, and uh, I just want to thank you guys so much for being there for me. Ben, just know you're with us. We love you. You're part of the team. You'll always be part of the team. So every team they've played against, they've had like the, the boys sign, the other boys on the other team sign the jersey, and then they're going to bring that back for me. So it's pretty cool. We have cried a lot over Ben's diagnosis, and I do believe that we've cried just as much over the outwarming support. Uh, it means everything. I'd say. It's a pretty big deal. Definitely helps a lot. It just keeps my spirits high.
and then just to know how many people are out there with supporting me is super cool. You know, he really motivated us today. Uh, he's out here on the floor with us. We're FaceTiming him. We've got a medal for him. And Ben, this is for you. And thanks for all your strength and support of us. And we're all uh, thinking of you. We're all fighting for you. Love you, Benny. Of course, Ben. See you soon. You know, there's a lot about that story that is unique. That's why it ended up being on the moment. But uh, at the same time, it is similar to so many stories of people battling with cancer across the country and the solidarity of family and friends. In Ben's case, he's uh, having his third round of chemo right now. The fourth uh, round is September, and doctors hope that he'll be able to get back home in Victoria by October. That is The National for August 21st. Good night.